So now, we'll, after we learn how to calculate the solubility of insoluble salts in just pure water, now we want to consider if some other ions are present in that same solution, how that's going to affect solubility. Because most of the time, you're not going to just have your salt in there, you're going to have some other stuff. And so the first one we're going to look at is something called the common ion effect. If you have another ion in solution that is the same exact ion that you also have in your insoluble salt, how is that going to affect the solubility of the insoluble salt? Well, it might be not too difficult to see this from the perspective of Le Chalier's principle. And let's think about, for example, the lead iodide salt that we just calculated the solubility of in a prior video. If Let's say I already have some iodide ions that are floating around in solution, and that could come from a soluble salt. For example, let's say Ki or NaI, which dissociate completely to produce those iodide ions. You can probably see how if I already have some amount of the iodide, that's going to drive my reaction to the left, because that's what Le Chalier's principle tells us, which is that if you add product, uh, reaction is going to shift to the left side to compensate for the additional product. And of course, what that means overall is that the solubility of this salt is now going to decrease because it's just not going to be able to produce as much lead and iodide because there's already some iodide present. And so what we're going to do is try to show that using a calculation. But before we do that, I just want to show you an actual experimental observation of this effect. This is actually a solution of saturated lead iodide. So saturated just means that we've dissolved as much of the lead iodide as possible in water. And usually what happens with saturated solution is you'll have the solution and you have some precipitate at the bottom. And what they did here is they filter out the precipitate. So all you have is just a solution, but it is saturated, meaning that it's the maximum amount of ions that are possible that are floating around. Now, what they did here is add this solution of potassium iodide. Again, that will completely split apart because it's a soluble salt to produce the iodide ion. As soon as it adds that potassium iodide, you actually start seeing the formation of the precipitate. And again, that shows you that once you put in the iodide, less of that original lead iodide salt is going to be able to dissolve. And so it just switches back to form the precipitate. And that's why you see it in the beaker. So we're going to show this with a calculation using this example right here. And so it's just asking, what is the molar solubility of lead iodide in 0.1 molar Ki? So again, now you have some iodide already present from the Ki. The KSP is this. I would point out that the previous problem we worked on in a prior video is also asking for the solubility of PBI2 when you just have water. And so in that case, the answer was this. So we're going to try to compare this number to the number we're going to calculate here. The calculation is pretty much the same way as you did earlier, with the exception that now there is some iodide already produced by potassium iodide. Again, you got to differentiate between the soluble salt, which is potassium iodide in this case, which just dissociate completely and produces all the iodide based on how much potassium iodide I have. So in this case, I have 0.1 molar potassium iodide. So what I'm going to get at the end is 0.1 molar iodide ion. Now we inspect the equilibrium for the insoluble salt, which is PBI2. So it's going to produce the PB ion and then the two iodide ion. The difference is at the beginning, you already have 0.1 molar of iodide coming from that soluble salt. So it's 0 and 0.1 initially, and then our change is still the same. And then at equilibrium, we have x, and then we have 0.1 plus 2x now. So the insoluble salt is going to produce some iodide on top of the iodide that's already there. And we set up the calculation using the KSP expression, PB times I squared, which is just x and 0.1 plus 2x squared, which I simplify here using the small k assumption to just 0.1 squared, and that should equal the KSP value. So if I end up calculating it, I get x equals 7.1 times to minus 7 molar. That happens to equal your lead ion concentration, but it also is the solubility of lead iodide. Now, that number alone might not be that meaningful to you, but it's more meaningful when you compare it to the solubility of lead iodide that we calculated prior lecture when it was just in pure water. In that example, we found that the solubility of PBI2 in pure water is 1.21 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. So you can see how big the reduction is in solubility. So as soon as you have that common ion, the iodide coming from the potassium iodide, the solubility decreases by a factor of four orders of magnitude, which is about 10,000 times less soluble. So it's really important to account for the presence of the common ion.
So our next discussion, now that we understand the common ion effect and how the presence of a shared ion will reduce the solubility of an insoluble salt, is to look at solubility of hydroxide salt. And the reason this discussion comes after the common ion effect is because hydroxide salts are dissolved in water, but water itself already contains some hydroxide. So in order to calculate the solubility of hydroxide salts, you do need to take into account the presence of the hydroxide from the water and see which of the two produces more hydroxide. So the way you approach calculation of the hydroxide salt solubility is to look at how much hydroxide the salt produced versus hydroxide from water. We know from water it will produce 10 to the minus 7 molar and so it's really about comparing the value of hydroxide concentration from the salt to 10 to the minus 7. And the way we do it is the following. If the hydroxide from water is higher, so in other words 10 to the minus 7 is higher than the hydroxide you calculate from the insoluble salt, then you would just assume that there is 10 to the minus 7 molar of hydroxide present in the solution because that number is bigger so it will be the dominant reaction. However, if the hydroxide from water is smaller than the hydroxide from the insoluble salt, in other words the salt produces more than 10 to the minus 7 molar of hydroxide, then your calculation should assume that the hydroxide primarily comes from the salt. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do these calculations based on the example here. It's just asking what is the molar solubility of each of these salts in water. So it gives you two of these salts, both hydroxide salt, both have KSP values associated with them. And then the last question is, what is the pH of a saturated solution of magnesium hydroxide, which is that second salt there? So let's take a look at how we analyze this. As I said, just now, the main thing is you want to calculate the hydroxide from the salt using your KSP, and then you want to compare that number to 10 to the minus 7 to see which number is bigger. So let's take a look at that first one, which is iron 3 hydroxide. We can write the reaction this way. At equilibrium, we know we're going to have X quantity of ion for the iron, and then 3X of the hydroxide. If we just let that equal KSP with the KSP expression, we'll get 27X to the fourth equals to the KSP value of 4 times times 10 to the minus 38. Solving for x gives us this number right here. Now that number is smaller than 10 to the minus 7. Because of that, you're going to just use 10 to the minus 7 as your hydroxide concentration. So we're going to go back and now calculate solubility of the actual salt. Now we set up an ice table. We have zero iron at the beginning. Now our hydroxide is just going to be 10 to the minus 7 at the beginning. It's always there. And then plus x plus 3x, and then x, and then 10 to the minus 7 plus 3x. But because we already did this comparison, we know that the 10 to the minus 7 is going to dominate. So then it's just equal to 10 to the minus 7. You can look at this as a small k approximation, but then sometimes it's the 10 to the minus 7 that's bigger. Sometimes it's the x that's bigger. And so when we do our calculation, we would say x times 10 to the minus 7 q is going to equal to the KSP value, and then solving for X gives us 4 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. That's the same as the iron ion concentration, but of course that iron ion comes from the iron hydroxide salt, so that's also the same as the solubility of the iron hydroxide. So that's what the solubility is for iron hydroxide. Now notice that if you just go ahead and use your standard calculation using X and 3X, you're going to get a pretty different number. It will actually give you this number right here. 10 to the minus 10, which is a much higher solubility than is actually observed, right? So you're going to get the wrong answer, in other words. So that's why it's really important to make this comparison and make sure that you use the correct value for the hydroxide. Now let's take a look at that second problem, which is for magnesium hydroxide. So in this case, again, we will say that at equilibrium, we're going to have X2X of the ion, and then we set that equal to the KSP expression, so 4x cubed equals to the value of KSP. And when we solve, we find a number that's equal to approximately 10 to the minus 4, which is bigger than 10 to the minus 7. So now, the situation is exactly opposite from the situation problem number 1. Here, the salt produces more hydroxide than water. So if that's the case, then we would just use the salt OH minus to make our calculation. I'm gonna reset the ice table again. It's really the same calculation that we just did. So we'll start with zero and zero. So notice that I'm not putting the 10 to the minus seven there because we already know that 10 minus seven is gonna be insignificant relative to the hydroxide that's produced by the salt. And then it's now X and 2X at equilibrium. So we'll let that equal to each other. We solve, we get this number, right? Which is a number we already got earlier. So this is really just kind of a little redundant, but 
I just wanted to show you that we are now ignoring the 10 to the minus 7. That's the same as the magnesium ion concentration, but the magnesium ion comes from the salt, so therefore that's also the solubility of the magnesium hydroxide. Now the third question is interesting because it's saying, what is the pH of this magnesium hydroxide solution? Well, pH can be calculated for hydroxide since we know that it produces OH minus, we can use 14 minus POH to calculate the pH. And that's exactly what I did here. 14 minus minus law of the OH concentration. The OH minus concentration is 2x. So it will be two times this number right here, which is the value of x. And so when you calculate, you get value of 10.5 as pH. The experiment is like this. So if you take magnesium hydroxide solid, you dump it in water until its saturation, which means you can't dissolve any more magnesium hydroxide. At the end, when you have that solution at saturation, the pH would be 10.5, okay? Because the magnesium hydroxide itself is going to produce more hydroxide that it overpowers the hydroxide that water produces.